Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are discussing the October surprise and independent journalism with Nat Perry, who is an author, an independent journalist, and the editor of the recently published book, which I highly recommend, American Dispatches, a Robert Perry reader, as well as the article at Consortium News, New York Times catches up to Perry, but still falls short on October surprise. Nat Perry, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks a lot for having me. Good to be here. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for all the work you've been doing for years. Uh, now, when you say catches up to Perry, which Perry are we talking about? <laughs> yeah, well, I guess that is a little confusing, isn't it? But uh, yeah, that's uh, the, the headline that uh, the editor, Joe Loria, went with. But yeah, I think he was, he, he's referring to my dad, Robert Perry. I mean, he was the one that um, really, you know, blazed the trail on the uh, October surprise reporting. So I, I think that, that he, he's the Perry being referenced there. I, I think he he broke ground in reporting on quite a few stories, including mm. the October surprise. Um, for anyone who, who hasn't paid attention to the New York Times for a week or so and hasn't paid attention to Robert Perry for decades, uh, you know, would have been informed a little faster than waiting for the New York Times. Uh, what is the October surprise? Um, well, it's a bit of a complicated story, but I guess simple in some ways. Um, uh, so basically, it refers to this um, controversy that uh, arise, arose from the um, 1980 presidential election, um, Ray, Ronald Reagan against Jimmy Carter. And at the time, of course, there was a hostage crisis in Tehran, Iran, following the Iranian Revolution of 1979. Um, it was a major story for over a year, um, 52 American hostages being held at the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. Um, and it was really the defining story of 79 and 1980. And um, Jimmy Carter, of course, was working very hard to get these hostages freed um, and um, were you know, holding meetings and conducting diplomacy to um, get the hostages freed. And the October surprise, um, Actually, this, you know, it's become kind of a, a common uh, term in our vernacular, October surprise, but the, the first time that it was used was for this election in 1980. Um, and what it was was a fear in the Ronald Reagan campaign that uh, Jimmy Carter would manage to get the hostages freed just before the election, which they feared would boost his uh, reelection chances. So they were allegedly, I guess we should still say, uh, working behind the scenes the Ronald Reagan campaign, um, led by um, William Casey, who then became CIA director. Um, they were working behind the scenes, meeting with the Iranians and promising them a better deal um, if they held the hostages there until Ronald Reagan was elected. They, they felt that that would destroy Carter's reelection opportunities. And um, it seems that they were right. You know, um, his, he never managed to get the hostages freed and um, it pretty much um, sunk his reelection chances. So um, at that point, well, after the election, I mean, pretty much immediately, I, as far as I understand, there were sort of rumors that, that this had happened, you know, and it kind of um, was a bit of a unspoken or open secret, I guess, in Washington. Uh, but then it really became known after the Iran-Contra affair broke that my, my father kind of broke uh, working for the Associated Press. And um, they, when they were looking into this during the uh, congressional investigation uh, in 87, they kind of, they realized that the arms shipments to Iran uh, were sort of, were, um, they had their beginnings during the 19, in 1980. Because the assumption was that it started in the mid 80s. But so people started looking into that again. And uh, it kind of, bubbled up into, you know, in the early 90s, um, there was some good journalism being done. Um, at the time, you know, it's kind of hard to imagine now, but, uh, you know, the mainstream media was really pursuing this story, especially Nightline. They had a really good um, documentary in uh, June 1991, and it kind of was bubbling up at that time. And then the media, um, they kind of closed ranks. There was some 
stories published uh, by the New York, uh, the New Republic, and uh, and Newsweek that sort of debunked or tried to debunk the story by claiming that William Casey couldn't have been in this this key meeting in Madrid uh, because he was at this conference in London, and uh, but those that alibi fell apart pretty easily. Um, then there was this congressional investigation, which um, also tried to debunk the whole story and kind of came up with a new alibi for William Casey. Um, but those were also sort of debunked by, by my dad, who discovered this trove of secret documents that were um, part of the investigation, but uh, were not included in the final report because they didn't support the, the official narrative. So in a nutshell, I guess that's, that's the story. Um, the New York Times has just kind of added a new wrinkle to it with uh, a claim from uh, this guy, Ben Barnes, who uh, worked for John Connolly. And he claims now that he accompanied John Connolly on one of these visits um, to the Middle East to try to sabotage Carter's um, hostage negotiation. So it seems to me, Nat Perry, that your dad, Robert Perry, documented this extensively, including with those documents from Congress decades ago. I've, I've not had a, a glimmer of a doubt that this wasn't as well established as any other piece of history for decades. Uh, and now the New York Times has added the, the John Connolly's role to the story. Uh, it, it doesn't doesn't seem to alter the basic narrative very much, just or reconfirms it and adds another player. Uh, why in the world do we still have to say allegedly? It, it's, <laughs> explain to me, when is it that you say allegedly and when is it that you don't? I don't know. I mean, I, in the article I just published at Consortium News, I, I did use allegedly and I, I struggled with that question myself because, I mean, I, I think, I mean, we, and this is why I do welcome this New York Times article, even though, I mean, they're sort of, yeah. They're still sort of playing games, and they're sort of whitewashing the history a bit. And yeah, you know, there's yeah, there's some complaints I would have about the article, but I mean, I think it helps, you know, to establish the, the reality that this did happen. And and I think we, you know, we really need to kind of move past that. Um, yeah, and maybe I should be more careful as well <laughs> when I talk about it or write about it. To, you know, maybe drop the allegedly because I mean. The, the evidence is overwhelming. I mean, I think anyone who, and, and th this goes back when I first started, you know, looking into this story, when my dad was writing about it in the mid nineties, that's when I, and I read his book, uh, Trick or Treason first, and then his follow-up work on the October Surprise X-Files, um, these documents that were, um, you know, classified that didn't support the narrative. So the, the congressional investigation um, sort of put them in a box and tried to hide them away. And, um, anyway, we, we, even back then, it was, it was, I think any reasonable person looking at the evidence, you know, you have to conclude that you know, this happened. And, and the thing is, like, in the early 90s, that was kind of where it was going, you know. And if you look, if you go back to that, there's this really good uh, Nightline documentary in June 1991, which is available on YouTube. Um, you know, you, you just watch that at that time, because there, there was a there was sort of open inquiry at that time. But then they, yeah, they sort of closed ranks. And then that congressional investigation just established the conventional wisdom. And the New York Times also participated in that because they gave uh, Lee Hamilton, who led the congressional investigation, space on their op-ed page. Um, and he published an op-ed called Case Closed. And it, yeah, relying on these bogus alibis for um, yeah, William Casey and others, uh, sort of to establish you know that this is the official story and, and that's when it became really toxic radioactive and um you know made it very difficult for journalists like my dad to continue covering it anyone who did you know their career <laughs> suffered um, and this is also i mean this is why actually because of the stories why he launched consortium news in the first place um because he he had access to all these documents and no one was interested you know by the mid 90s it was just like you know, it, it was just shut down. There's no space for um, you know, re uh, real journalism on this. So he started this independent media project to um, create a home for this kind of journalism. So and it's, it's good to see the New York Times finally catching up. And, he, and they did give my dad a bit of credit. They uh, referenced one of his um, articles. Um, they could have referenced a lot more, honestly, because it was just sort of 
but um, one aspect of the story that they gave him credit for, but you know, at least they did that. And, and they did some actually some good journalism there too. I mean, he, the uh, reporter Peter Baker um, sort of confirmed Ben Barnes's story that um, John Connolly, they, so they went to the Lyndon Baines Johnson Library and uh, they found some documents that um, confirmed, they found um, Connolly's itinerary from that period in, uh, I think it was uh, June um, 1980. And uh, showed that he did go to these countries that Ben Barnes um, claims he went to. So, you know, yeah. so it just adds a little to this to the narrative. I think it just um, kind of gives a little more context that it, it looks like Ben Barnes went first, and then um, there were follow up visits by you know, William Casey, and then in, in, in October, um, Connolly. Uh, and this is something my dad reported on you know, years ago that. He had heard rumors from the Middle East that uh, Carter was about to achieve uh, his objective in getting the hostages free. And that was October, just a, a few weeks before, or maybe just a week before the election or something like that. Um, and that's when Casey <laughs> allegedly or not so allegedly went, went to Madrid for this final meeting. That, and basically what they did was they, they, um, they just offered the Iranians more weapons, better weapons or whatever, you know, cheaper, you know, this is all about weapons they were giving and th this is another aspect so they not only were they keeping these hostages in this situation for you know several months longer than they should have been um but they were arming iran who you know <laughs> was this was a uh, sworn enemy and designated as an enemy by, by the united states government um so it really just kind of shows like how much um you know what they're willing to do, you know, to uh, achieve their objectives, and yeah. So I mean, that's I mean, it, that's also why I think it was so important for the Washington establishment to just try to squash the story as much as possible. So Nat Perry, what will happen now with this story? I mean, the New York Times seems to have flipped from decades ago saying the case closed, we need to bury this conspiracy nutty theory once and for all to it happened and we've been the ones to figure out how to prove it happened and we still we still denounce the the uh, the evidence that others came up with that we ignore that Casey took certain trips but we do report on what Connolly did and that Connolly reported to Casey and that they did it and that yeah. as you say the Republicans engaged in the highest level of cynicism mm -hmm giving weapons to their sworn enemies, keeping U.S. hostages hostage longer and so forth. Will that become common knowledge, uh, accepted history? Will it go in the textbooks that the, the Republican legislatures are revising? Will, will every story that mentions that period of time and that election refer to it as understood wisdom? Or will we go on saying allegedly uh, from here on out? Well, no, it's a good question. I, I guess you know only time will tell. You know, but I mean, I think we've we've always sort of been, you know, it's always been very close to, you know, an accepted history. I mean, I remember even when I was in um, uh, as a history undergrad at uh, George Mason University, I remember reading a book at that time in the you know mid '90s, and um, it, like just one of the textbooks that were that was assigned by my professor and. Uh, and it had, it kind of mentioned it mentioned something about it. Cause I remember telling my dad that um, it mentioned it actually it cited his book Trick or Treason, and um, so but I think it said something like it should be taken with a grain of salt. But there there is uh, there is some evidence pointing to this um, conspiracy or whatever, um, you know. So I think it's always been signed, you know somewhat close to that, you know. And I, so hopefully this New York Times article kind of just removes any of the lingering doubts. And um, like you say, I mean, it, it really, you know, it really should be the accepted, you know, narrative. But, but I think, I mean, it's clear what they're doing though at the same time. I mean, if you read their article closely, it's kind of covering, you know, Congress and, and their own and the New York Times' own ass because they're, I mean, they're basically, the article said um, that this, what makes the Barnes claims new is that uh, he's not like one of these shady arms dealers, you know, so it kind of denigrates the sources, even it, it ignores, and ignores um, many of the other very credible sources um, 
you know, uh, yes, but some of them were arms dealers because this is a, a story about arms. Who's going to know about arms dealing if they're arms <laughs> dealers? So they kind of, you know, it, it, but um, so I think that's what they're doing. They're trying to um, make it acceptable. And, and, and it looks like Carter's about to pass away. He's in hospice care. And that, that's what motivated Barnes to come forward, I think, is that he doesn't want to see, you know, all the, um, uh, these segments we're going to see on TV whenever, you know, uh, whenever Carter passes away. Because uh, this is a big part of his legacy, you know. I mean, it's, you know, we're going to see these retrospective, you know, segments on in the media. And um, and I think that's what sort of motivates Barnes at this point to try to correct the record. And uh, so we'll see. I mean, I think it'll be interesting to see, you know, you know whenever Carter does pass away, see how they handle this. Um, but I, I did notice, I said there was a, there's actually a very good um, documentary on, I think it was Netflix or maybe HBO uh, recently about the, the hostage crisis. And um, it, did, it handled everything very well. I mean, I learned a lot from it I mean, just in terms of, you know, what happened in 1979 and, you know, how, you know, how they ended up taking over the embassy and all that. But then they just totally skirted the whole <laughs> question of the um, negotiations and, you know, avoided the, um, you know, the October surprise controversy. But yeah, um, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, you know, only time will tell. But I mean, the New York Times, you know, for whatever reason, it still carries a lot of weight. Um, you know, I think a lot of it's uh, just undeserved credibility in some ways. But you know, that it's still the the paper of record, I guess. So um, you know, if they if they're now saying it's the, that it really happened, then maybe that'll be the new narrative. Under understatement of the day, I think New York Times undeserved credibility. Um, the the October surprise is just one of many stories in this book, Nat Perry, that you've edited called American Dispatches, a Robert Perry reader. There we go. Yeah, if you're watching our video, you can see the book there. You can can you give us a few hints of some of the other stories? Uh, some of them, I think, follow the saga of the deals made with Iran and the Contras and the CIA and the cocaine all of which I think makes better sense in if pieces aren't left out of the story as has been the the norm, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, well, yeah, it was sort of what, what motivated me to first start um, collecting these articles. And you know, I had this idea a few years ago because I, um, I realized like I had never really read a lot of the articles my dad wrote, like the ones that really kind of it, it, when he was breaking these important stories in the 1980s, um, you know, I, I sort of, I mean, I was a child at that time. I, I didn't really start reading his work until, you know, the mid nineties. Um, so, you know, I kind of, I, I personally wanted to go back and, you know, read these um, articles. So, um, but it, it, so it actually it starts when he was a student journalist uh, in the 19, uh, early 1970s. Um, so the first article was from May Day, 1970. Uh, he was arrested in D.C. with um, thousands of other anti-war demonstrators and uh, follows his work, you know, as a beat reporter in the 70s and then into the 80s when he was assigned to um, the uh, investigative unit at the Associated Press. And, um, you know, he, he started looking into following the Reagan administration's Central America policy, um, mostly and. So it covered all these, um, you know, atrocities in, in Central America, like the El Mozote massacre in, uh, in El Salvador and the Contra War um, in, in Nicaragua. And, uh, and so, but his big, um, you know, break was really when he, you know, he, he uncovered the uh, Contra cocaine trafficking um, and tied that to the Central Intelligence Agency. And um, there's also an early story from the 80s of the, the CIA mining the harbors of Nicaragua, and um, uh, you know some big stories there. And, um, and then the Iran Contra story, of course, he was the first one to write about uh, Oliver North's operation in the White House. They had all kinds of operations to try to. So when Congress prohibited aid to the Contras because of all the atrocities they were committing, um, the Reagan administration found all sorts of ways to kind of work around uh, the the ban on. Uh, aid and uh, one of those ways was by diverting funds from arms sale to Iran to the Nicaraguan Contras. So he, you know, was the first to write about that. And um, 
and you know follows his work through the 90s and when he kind of decided to sort of break with mainstream journalism and start his own independent media project mainly because of this uh, as I said, the October surprise story that no one was interested in at that point. And, uh, and then, you know, so it, but it follows all the way through the 2000s, the Bush years and Obama and yeah, all the way into the Trump years and when he passed away in, uh, in, in early 2018. So from 1970 to 2018. So it's, it's pretty comprehensive. I mean, the challenge was like really deciding what to edit and how much, because <laughs> there's so much good material. It could have been you know, a 10 or 20 volume set, really, uh, if I included everything, but I uh, wanted to keep it somewhat readable. So um. I, I think you did an excellent job. And I, I it, it occurs to me that that Reagan and some of the people working with him were just infinitely cynical, as as we've described. I think maybe Oliver North was a true believer. Uh, I mean, 19... 86, seven, I was going to high school with Oliver North's daughter in, in Herndon High School in Virginia. And he came in and talked to our class about how close the commies were in Nicaragua. And mm -hmm. why our teachers didn't have us properly scared. Uh, and yeah. so forth. So I, I mean, do you, some of these people believe this stuff, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think, I mean, this is also, but what, what's occurred to me with the sort of uh, pondering this New York Times article on October Surprise and kind of you know revisiting the this 1980 uh, you know, how how this all started with the Reagan era and and it, you know but I mean that also I mean, that really brought the neocons um, it, it gave them this huge platform and I mean it, before before that I mean the neocons were just you know this sort of obscure you know um, intellectual movement I guess and. I mean, it was really during the Reagan years where all these people like Elliot Abrams and Oliver North. I mean, it, these. I mean, they are like they're, they're very ideological, uh, ideologically driven, um, true believers, as you say. And um, yeah, I mean, and I, I mean, one thing that's also interesting, um, re going back and reading some of my dad's early work in the in the early 1980s, um, because one of the articles included in their reader is um, about how a lot of the the foreign policy advisors that Reagan was bringing in, they were veterans of Vietnam War, you know, and and they felt that, you know, the U.S. should have wanted Vietnam, so they wanted to have another chance, you know, to uh, to win the Cold War, and I mean, so they were, yeah, they they really were true believers. I mean, some of the most, uh, you know, extreme kind of neocons, and um, and, you know, and if you look at kind of the past forty years, I think it's they've just become, you know, more and more mainstream and i mean kind of just have taken over both parties with this sort of i think in granada and panama and then the gulf war they these were all attempts to to cure us of the vietnam syndrome right to, that's right yeah to the illness of opposing mass murder uh they yeah. want to, to cure us of that right yeah yeah and one of the things my dad always uh, highlighted um uh, you know about the persian gulf war the first uh iraq war was the first thing that George Bush said when when that war was over was, "By God, we've kicked the Vietnam syndrome once and for all." And I mean, I think that it really goes a long way to show like what their motivations were in some ways, because you know yeah. what happened in Vietnam, this humiliating defeat for the U.S. and you know the um, validation of sort of anti-war sentiment and uh, this reluctance to um, engage in foreign conflicts and. Um, yeah, they really saw that Gulf War as the, the final nail in the coffin of that, you know, reluctance to go to war, which they called the Vietnam Syndrome. I think uh, I, I, there's a quote I think comes from your dad uh, that I don't care what the truth is, I care what the truth is. Um, <laughs> I, I hope I'm attributing that correctly. And yeah, yeah, no, it, it's, I think it's just a matter of what you emphasize uh, in the how you say it. It's like, I don't care what the truth is. I just care what the truth is or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Sort of the point being, yeah, like, you, know, you you shouldn't care about promoting an agenda by, uh, or, you know, allowing your biases to, uh, to shield you from pursuing the truth or whatever, but yeah, just to tell the truth. So anyway, it's a, yeah, it's a good quote, um, but yeah, we're probably both 
butchering it a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. But I, 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 well, I don't know what the proper way to say it out loud is, but I think if you, even if you read it, if you think yeah. about it for a minute, you get the point. And, right. and I think if you look at this book and all this reporting uh, by your dad, uh, Robert Perry, you, it, it's, it's not on the side of anything other than the truth. Uh, and he goes after uh, Republican and Democratic uh, criminals and corrupt uh, figures equally. And wasn't wasn't much of a fan of Russiagate, I think. No, no, he was. I mean, he was really one of the early skeptics of Ru Russiagate, and I mean, he, he didn't really buy any of it. And um, I remember he, he appeared on probably his last appearance on Democracy Now um, was uh, as the Russiagate um, controversy was heating up, and Amy Goodman asked him like who he thought should uh, lead an investigation into Russiagate, and he. He said, look, I, you know, first of all, there's nobody in Washington that we can count on anymore because, you know, there, there's, you know, if you expect some sort of wise person to sort of lead an impartial investigation, you know, you should forget it because these people don't exist in Washington anymore. And secondly, there's no, there's nothing to investigate, you know, um, you know, you don't just launch investigations without like some basis in the invest for, for having an investigation. So he, he just, he did, he rejected the whole. Um, yeah, wonderful, as he should have. Um, we've, we've been the worse off for it ever since. Um, we, we've we got uh, three or four, two or three minutes left. Uh, Nat Perry, I think your dad would be thrilled to see Consortium News still going strong. What what uh, what has Consortium News been working on and what are the, the, the plans going forward? Well, um, the editor in chief, Joe Loria, is doing a great job. I mean, he, he handles, you know, all the day to day work. Um, you know, I, I have a pretty um, limited role at this point. I'm on the the board, um, but uh, so he's, um, you know, the, the past uh, week or so has been been publishing a lot of articles uh, on the Iraq War's 20th anniversary, which I'd really recommend. I mean, it's just a very important anniversary that we should all keep in mind and. Um, so there's a lot of good uh, good content there to sort of um, recall what how crazy that all was 20 years ago when we decided to launch this war against Iraq. Um, um, and you know, I think um, we're just continuing to to do to do what we've been doing and um, following in the footsteps uh, of my dad and you know yeah. pursuing this you know, independent media project. I, I can remember meeting with your dad and a couple other friends uh, many years ago and him talking about the importance of journalism and communications and rather sneering, mockingly dismissing people putting energy into community organizing <laughs> as if it didn't really even exist. I think he had no idea that I had spent years working on community <laughs> organizing and, and, and yet I I, I could I, I continue every minute of my life to agree with him more about the importance of communications. I mean, it's yeah. the top yeah. need, right? Absolutely. I mean, I think that's. I mean, I must say, I remember some of those comments that he would make about you know organizing and how he sort of disparaged that. And I, you know, I, I never, I didn't always agree with him on some of that. Um, I was also, I have a background in activism and that stuff and I always thought I mean I do I still feel that's important you know but uh but yeah he, he definitely saw um the importance of independent media and I hope he would be I mean because I, I think now and with your show and so many other you know similar podcasts and uh you know uh, using all the tools of you know YouTube and Rumble and everything to um get these alternative views out I mean I, I think it's it's really kind of Come into its own. Um, so I hope he would be at least um, somewhat pleased with uh, you know how things have developed in the in the independent media sphere over the past few years. I, I hope so. Um, we've been speaking with Nat Perry. He's an author, an independent journalist, and the editor of the book uh, you need to read. It's called American Dispatches, a Robert Perry Reader. And if you go to Consortium News, you can read his latest article, New York Times Catches Up with Perry But Still Falls Short on October Surprise. Nat Perry, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks a lot for having me. It was a lot of fun.
This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.